All right. Hello. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining today for today's AIA approved presentation, Making Glass Come to Life, The Principles of Glass Selection. My name is Bo. I'm with Ace Lab. We help out with hosting these events. Um, and we've got Alan Kinder here from the Guardian Glass team who's going to be presenting the CEU portion. I am going to give a quick little intro, um, and my colleague Armand might be joining as well to, to give a quick little intro about Ace Lab. That'll be less than five minutes, and then we'll go ahead and get started with today's CEU portion. There's Armand. All right, so I'm first just going to really quick tell you how to find uh, Guardian Glass on Ace Lab. So if you have any follow up questions after today's event, this is a great place to come and get in touch with their team directly. Um, I will spare you any other further demos about Ace Lab, but if you have any questions, um, Armand's going to give a quick little spiel about how you can get in touch and uh, work a little more closely with Ace Lab for your product research. So everyone who registered today had an Ace Lab account automatically made for them. It's completely free, so you can just head to acelabusa.com to explore. And if you know exactly the manufacturer you're looking for, you can use this search bar right at the top. Type in the name of any manufacturer, that'll start to auto-populate. You can head over to their page on Ace Lab, and we've got this contact button right at the top. So this is a great place to come after today's event. Um, if you want to connect directly with the Guardian Glass team with any questions about today's webinar or about their products in general, feel free to come over to this page and use this little contact button. Um, a few quick housekeeping items from me. Um, we did ask for AIA numbers upon registration. I will also send over a form in the chat. So if you are worried that you didn't include it, feel free to fill out that form. Um, and we will make sure that your credits get reported directly to AIA. Um, and then other than that, just please submit questions to the Q&A box throughout today's webinar. We'll save some time at the end to get to those. And if we don't get to your question, we'll have a record of it to follow up after the event. All right, that's all for me. I'm gonna hand it over to my colleague Armand for a quick little intro about how you can work with Ace Lab, and then we'll go ahead and get started with the CEU portion. All right, great, thanks, Bo. This will be very short. Um, I just wanted to introduce everyone to both myself and our product concierge program, which is a free consulting service we offer through Ace Lab for um, our, uh, looking for firms, uh, looking for material research um, on their project, on their product projects as a whole. And so what we're able to provide is uh, free access to on-demand material experts, such as myself. I'm a licensed architect in New York, and we have a team full of architects and spec writers that you'll be able to use to help improve the selection on your various projects and your library. So a quick example of what that looks like, uh, we do things between uh, material research and recommendations, providing you comparison reports, and then just giving you access and connecting you with manufacturers within our extremely extensive network. Uh, one uh, question I got just this past week was a question about um, high traffic flooring materials that people could use for university laboratories. This was a project that uh, the firm was doing for the first time down in Florida, and we were able to come back with options ranging from epoxy flooring, vinyl flooring, rubber flooring, and linoleum to help reduce the options for the architect. And then finally, within those, give some um, information like epoxy flooring is highly durable, chemical resistant, um, versus vinyl flooring is durable, but easy to install compared to epoxy flooring. And then finally, linoleum in this case has much lower VOCs and it's overall a more renewable product. And then from there, we can help break it down to manufacturers as well. Funny enough, Alan, actually, uh, I have a project that's asking about some glazing requirements, so I'm going to reach out to you later this week. Um, Perfect timing. <laughs> yeah, something around those right lines. Um, it's about like simulated uh, lights and so forth, and so it'd be great to get your take. But anyway, um, if you'd like to, you know, uh, learn a little bit more about what the product concierge program entails and how you get access to these experts as a whole, um, please answer Bo's survey. She'll be dropping a question if you're interested in learning more, and I'll reach out to you. Um, and I'll also drop a link to my meeting um, calendar in the chat. Um, but anyway, on to you, Alan. Perfect. Thanks so much for the introduction and for y'all hosting today. I'm going to attempt to take over screen share. So that should be, I believe, showing any minute now. And let me know if y'all have the making glass come to life visual. Great. Yep. Perfect. Well, again, appreciate the introduction, Bo and Armand, and uh, great to be here today. Appreciate everybody that has elected to attend to dedicate your time to join. Uh, quick introduction before we get into the core topic of well about just who Guardian is, 
uh, why we're teaching today's course of making glass come to life, principles of glass selection. And the reason we're doing that is because Guardian is a global manufacturer of glass and coated products. Uh, so I mentioned we are a global manufacturer. So we have presence uh, with 25 different float plants spread across U.S., uh, well, excuse me, across North America, South America, Europe, Middle East, Asia, and, and Africa as well. So uh, within that group, our domestic or our global headquarters is based domestically in Auburn Hills, Michigan, just outside of Detroit. And we do have very robust operations within the U.S. of multiple float glass lines. On average, our furnaces might be between uh, or around 740 tons. You know, certainly there's some adjusted sizes there, but Basically, what that means is we make 740 tons of glass a day, 365 days a year. So it is continuous manufacturing. We're hopefully constantly pulling a ribbon of glass out of our furnaces. To kind of uh, right size the tonnage, it's about 12 miles of glass produced per day. So you can talk about high volume manufacturing, just a, a bulk of glass coming out of each of these furnaces. And as I mentioned, we have 25 plants per day. What do we do with that glass? If our customers simply want raw glass components, we can sell that to them. But we also manufacture low E coatings and other various performance coatings so that we can enhance the performance of this glass, both in terms of optics as well as thermal, uh, solar, or durability performance as well. We also are a manufacturer of uh, wet coated products, so mirror manufacturing, and we also have some additional architectural lamin laminating lines as well as pattern glass components. This is a quick overview of, of kind of our U.S. footprint uh, with where we produce our products. Uh, so you can see that we have great regional coverage, and that's one of the great aspects of, of working with Guardian is to make sure that regardless if that project is in New York City, uh, Miami, Florida, Dallas, Texas, Los Angeles, California, that we have the ability to service your needs and make sure that we provide an efficient supply of glass that meets all design requirements. And the final thing that I really wanted to kind of go over before we jump in the AIA is where does Guardian fit in the supply chain? Because that's always a lot of questions we have related to glass, right? There's a lot of different things that can be done with glass, and there's a lot of different ways you can capture glass on a project. So Guardian is what we call a manufacturer. We source the raw materials, we melt them down, and we produce that glass substrate on the float glass line. As I mentioned, we're also applying various coating to the stock sheets of that glass. Now, the stock sheets can range in size, but if we're talking commercial coated, our general size for that is a 130 by 204 inch sheet size. We would then sell that to fabricators, and the fabricators are taking those stock sheets of glass. Uh, they are cutting them to size. They're heat treating them. They're putting them into insulating glazing units. They're adding laminated component, components, uh, spandrel, pattern fritz, whatever additional value-add component that makes that insulating glass unit. They're producing that and then selling that to their customer, who is the glazing installer. Now, this can be a, a field glazed installation where they're, they're taking the sticks and building it on site. This can go to commercial window. This can go to unitizers or uh, some other hybrid components on there. But these are the experts that really join the glass with the glazing systems to capture it and build these beautiful facades. And of course, a major, major component of the supply chain continues to be uh, the architectural specifying community, uh, the consultants, those that have the vision of understanding why this project exists. What is that objective? What do we want to tell a story with this project? How do we want it to perform? How do we want to meet local energy codes, national energy codes, or even the voluntary programs to just make better built environments? So with that, and one of the reasons that we're glad to be partnering with ACE Lab is we can give you a lot of great information on ace labs website i think one of the things we're really attracted to is that contact us button glass especially glazing for the exterior facade in the commercial environment is very much a project specific choice so you can get the very basics but uh, we want to collaborate we want to work with you we really want to understand the vision and help make sure that we're part of that journey to get you to the proper glass and glazing material specifications so that you do meet all the individualized project objectives so that said, I'm going to jump into the actual uh, AIA portion of today's presentation, making glass come to life. Uh, and one of the things that I want to just really iterate, there's a lot of information crammed into this. We're going to go from everything of basics of glass manufacturing to all the other components that go into making uh, project-specific glazing units. And throughout that, we're going to identify the important uh, points of why things influence aesthetics, why they influence performance. How can you combine multiple product assemblies to achieve that final objective? And really at the end of the day, just make each of you more adept at understanding not 
the very specifics of, of being an expert on selecting glass, but what are the type of questions I should be asking so that I'm making sure that I'm dialing in uh, to the proper product solutions for my project? Great thing to talk about with uh, aesthetics of glass to start that conversation is glass is a chameleon building product. Absolutely everything impacts the aesthetics. So uh, uh, providing the performance information, your U value, your visible light, your reflectivity, your solar heat gain, that's all quantitative data and easy to, to put into performance calculator and spit out. The aesthetics piece is a little bit more of that journey, right? The artistic side. And we call, called glass a chameleon building product because everything absolutely will impact how do we perceive that glass visually? Is it reflective during a bright blue sunny day? And then is it more transmission at night? So obviously that dynamic lighting condition, a bright blue sunny day, nighttime and everything in between from rising sun to setting sun to cloudy to overcast, all of that's going to have a big impact on glass. Glass is a reflective building material. We can have high reflectivity or low reflectivity, but it's always got some degree of reflectivity. So obviously it's going to take on a little bit of the color tone of what it's reflecting. So bright blue sky, you'll see that glass look a little bluer in appearance. Cloudy overcast day, that glass is going to look a little truer to color because you have a neutral background that is reflecting within that, that glass component. Uh, you're also going to see that it's very easy to create that privacy condition, as I mentioned earlier, during daytime views, when we have the light source more balanced towards the exterior. More challenging to create vision glass panels and still have it offer privacy at night, where we switch that light source to be more on the interior side. So even your glass products that are highly reflective or, or dark, as soon as you switch that light source to the interior, you're going to get more transmission. You're going to have greater ability to see through that glass and see into that interior space. If we look at the two pictures uh, here, obviously uh, we can see a lot more color tone during the daytime as well, multiple different colors of spandrel on the right side, whereas that tends to blend together when uh, we lose that exterior light component. You'll also draw note, note to the right side of this building in each image, and what looks like a spandrel condition during the daytime view is actually a translucent panel. So you still have the look of privacy and, and a more opaque condition from the exterior during the daytime, but as soon as that light is behind it, you create this glowing uh, diffused light situation where it's hiding that stairwell, but still bringing light into that space. And that's a really important thing to, to keep in mind is that light transmission uh, is linear. So if you have 36% light transmission coming in, you're gonna have 36% light transmission coming out as well. So keep that in mind as you start to think about the various uses of this project. And is it an office building where we only expect to use it during the daytime, or is it gonna be hospitality, residential? And we see a lot more nighttime use. And that's really gonna help us uh, start to frame up the discussion. But let's start at the basics, right? We uh, a slightly different viewpoint of how we talk about glass moving through the supply chain as well, but really starts with the float glass manufacturers who are producing the glass in the big stock sheet format. Uh, applying the low E coatings, if it is going to be for that exterior facade, so that we can manipulate manipulate the way different forms of light are. Uh, interacting with that glass facade or, or ultimately either getting into that interior space or blocked away from entering that interior space. And of course, going to the fabricators to process those stock sheets into the glazing unit and selling it to the glazers who are doing that installation piece as well. So what we see here is a very generalized piece of glass. And let's imagine that this is our baseline commercial glass substrate, quarter inch thick, six millimeter thick, clear float glass. So the raw ingredients that go into that is about 50% silica sand. Uh, so obviously we, we mine sand and that's the base bone of making a glass product. The other ingredients that we do mix in with that are salt cake, soda ash, dolomite, and rouge iron oxide. I'll, I'll come back to that rouge in just a minute. Uh, but the other second largest ingredient next to silica sand is what we call cullet. And cullet is simply recycled glass content, broken glass. It takes less energy to melt existing glass to that molten glass state than it does sand. So by introducing cullet, we can reduce the uh, time of the furnace, the heat that we have to have that furnace, create a more uniform substrate as well. Now for this cullet content being recycled, a big portion of that recycled content in today's environment is pre-consumer recycled content. A lot of this came from our own byproduct of production that we can harness back into our raw materials and, and throw that back in the float line. But there are some call it buyback programs that are looking to buy that from customers as well. Reason a big chunk of that is pre-consumer is just making sure we maintain a quality of ingredients that goes into these raw glass substrates. By doing that, we can make sure that we reduce the number of defects that might come downstream if there was debris or any sort of 
of a, a, a negative metallic material that got mixed in with that that might lead to visual or, or performance uh, defects downstream. Now I wanna talk about the rouge or iron oxide content for just a minute that I, I mentioned because iron does give glass a little bit of its color. And if I mentioned that, if you were to take a clear piece of float glass, the commodity float glass that comes out of uh, domestic production, we call it clear, we call it neutral, but there is a little bit of a greenish tinge associated with that glass. And that's largely due to the iron content that exists uh, within that material makeup. So we do have the ability to produce a variety of different glass substrates. And we do that by either adding additional metal oxides or removing metal oxides to create different tinted substrates. Now this is a body composition tinted. So we're literally mixing that within the raw materials. And so it's not just the surface, it's, it's the entire tint is, uh, of, uh, or the entire, uh, component of that glass substrate is tinted. So if we want to make a blue glass, if we want to make a green glass, if we want to make a gray glass, we add in various metal oxides. Now, low iron is also a specialty substrate. Uh, we actually produce that by going with a sand source that has a lower iron content. So by reducing the iron, we get something that's much more color neutral, uh, higher light transmission, and a little bit more transparent than our standard clear glass product is. So I'm gonna take you to a quick video here to kind of illustrate that glass manufacturing process. It's a 3000 degree oven under roof. As I mentioned, if you happen to be in one of those locations where we had the float plants, we'd love to host a, a tour live. So you can feel free to reach out to that for us. But uh, this is also a little more climate controlled condition for us to do it uh, in the virtual environment. So within this, and I, I don't think you should hear the music, so apologies. Oh is what I was worried about. Sometimes it pauses on me. Bo, do you still hear me by chance? Is it just the, the screen that is messed up at the moment? I do hear you. Yeah, it just looks like the screen is frozen. Okay, bear with me. Let me see. I'm going to stop sharing for just a second to see if I can correct this. Let's see, and again, apologies for the technical glitches here. Should be back up and running in just a second and I'll skip the video so that we can keep working through it. All right, Bo, we back up and running on your side with the... Yep, yeah, I can see your screen again. All right, should say enhance with coatings. Okay, so again, apologies for the technical difficulties. Gave me a chance to catch my breath there. Uh, but what you would have seen is we take those raw materials that I mentioned earlier, and we move that into a batch house where we're mixing them all together to create that uh, raw ingredient mixture for the type of glass we want to produce. We then dump it into our main melting furnace, and that furnace is fired off of natural gas, but it's basically a 3,000 degree oven. And what that does is melt all those raw materials together, creating a molten river of glass. Uh, we then take that uh, molten glass to a secondary furnace to uh, reduce the temperature just slightly, making it a little more consistent, a little easier to work with. And then here's where we derive the name float glass. We pull a continuous ribbon of molten glass over a molten bath of tin. So much like oil on top of water, that glass ribbon floats on top of that tin bath. You would have seen these rollers or attenuators that help us control uh, the width of that ribbon, which along with line speed helps us control the thickness of that glass substrate. Our baseline glass is quarter inch thick, and that's in the commercial segment. And that's because typically the viscosity of glass, whenever you would just take it out of the furnace and drop it, it, it tends to want to settle about a quarter inch thick. Now, if we run that line speed much quicker, we can produce and stretch that ribbon out, we can produce a thinner glass substrate. So getting down to eighth inch glass or, or thinner. Uh, if we want to produce thicker glass, then we slow that line speed down and we can produce those uh, three eighths and half inch thick glass substrates as well. 
that continuous ribbon of molten glass then goes through what's called a leer. A leer is a slow controlled cooling process, which is annealing that glass, taking it from the molten state to that solid state. And that is typically done with forced air. So at that point, it still is a continuous ribbon of annealed glass. It goes through a visual inspection criteria where lasers read every square inch of that glass, give us the output of making sure it's the right optical quality that we're advertising for, mirror quality, greenhouse quality, commercial facade quality glass. And then we're optimizing the cutting uh, based of uh, the variety of different batches that we're producing for customer orders at that time. So we're actually cutting that ribbon online to those specific dimensions. If we have a, cu a customer that takes a lot of high volume cut sizes, you know, full truckload of a uh, three foot four by four foot six pieces of glass, we can cut that on our line to improve efficiencies of optimization. In the commercial world, we typically produce what's called stock sheets of glass. Historically, those were 96 inch by 130 inch or 102 inch by 140 inch. Over the last several years in our market, we've seen a gravitation towards more jumbo coated products. So our baseline there now tends to be a 130 inch by 204 inch sheet size, but we do have the capabilities of going 130 inch to 240 inch sheet sizes for those super jumbo opportunities. Not only can we make glass to that size, we can actually apply low E coatings to that glass size as well. And we'll talk a little bit now uh, to how we enhance the glass with these different coatings that I mentioned. So in terms of low E coatings, there's been several iterations through the decades of different type of, of performance coatings. One of the initial ones that was out there and still is available today, but a little, little dated, not quite as widely as available is the pyrolytic process. So this is actually a deposition of those metals into glass online when it's in that molten ribbon state. So you're depositing the metals in that glass. They're actually embedding a little bit of that glass. And we call these hard coats uh, uh, because they are typically baked in during that annealing process. So they're very robust. They're very durable. You also found that you had a, a greater opportunity to do larger sheet sizes of pyrolytic glass early on because if you it was online process, if you could produce a sheet of glass to that size, you could get the pyrolytic coating that size. Pyrolytics were all the rage many, many years ago when they were first launched, uh, but we have seen that performance codes, energy codes, as they've been continuing to tighten up, that pyrolytics just don't have the uh, desired solar heat gain and U-value performance that some of the more stringent energy code compliance paths do now. So sometimes pyrolytics are still used by themselves in certain applications, but sometimes they're used in conjunction with other coatings as well. The other kind of a limiting factor with pyrolytics is you didn't see as much changeover. So you would have a pyrolytic pyrolytic coating, and then the variability would come with what substrate you're applying it to. Was it clear glass? Was it a tinted glass substrate? Well, the next iteration and development led to the evolution of sputter coatings. And sputter coatings are actually an offline deposition of metal onto that glass when it's in that solid state. Uh, and sputter coatings are simply a uh, chain of coating chambers within each coating chamber is a metal target. And you essentially create a stack of different metals to give us that sputter coat. And so with that, we saw a lot more variability that we could have multiple aesthetics, multiple ranges of performance in light transmission, even when the substrate stays the same. So rather than uh, tinted substrates, which are typically done on campaign cycles, meaning that we have to dial into that tinted substrate. I mentioned earlier that these furnaces on average are about 740 tons. And they're running 365 days a year. You don't simply flip a switch and start producing that tinted substrate. It takes about three to four days to transition from a clear to that tinted substrate. It takes about three to four days on the back end to get back to that clear production state as well. So anytime you wanna make a tinted substrate, you might be losing six to 10 days worth of production time. So you can't simply uh, uh, react to making tinted substrates. You have to plan months and months and months in advance, build up inventories, uh, You know, make sure you're covered for that time when you might be transitioning. So uh, some of the tinted substrates may only be run once a year, some may be run you know, three or four times a year, just depending on uh, popularity. The sputter coating process allows for campaign cycles that are much more frequent, maybe on a six to 10 week campaign cycle. So with this, you can give the unique aesthetics, unique performance values, uh, and, and be a little more reactive to the market. 
Now, sputter coatings were first introduced as what we call traditional sputter coats. So with that, you actually had many of your glass and coating manufacturers were the fabricators. So you were cutting those glass pieces to size. You were applying the heat treatment, whether it was heat strengthened or fully tempered. Then you were running through the coating chambers, and then you were putting it into the insulating glass unit. There are many manufacturers out there now that produce what's called post-temperable sputter coats. And so with that, you are actually making those stock sheets of glass with the coating applied on it. And then you're selling it to a network of fabricators. So you might find that there's a 130 fabricators domestically now versus a few handful of manufacturers that operate as the fabricator. So more tempering furnaces, more ability to cut this glass. You can put stock sheets of glass in a more localized, regionalized supply. And you have fabricators that are trained and have the right equipment to handle that already coated piece of glass, cut it to size, heat treat it, put it into the insulating glass unit, and then sell it to the glazing contractor. I'm going to skip over that video because I'm scared to death that that will not work again. But this was simply showing the sputter coating process. So uh, basically to walk through that one, and, and these are on our website if you'd ever like to see the videos, they are worthwhile. Uh, but we call these magnetic vacuum sputter deposition, MVSD coatings. And that's the specific way we're sputtering these stacks of metal onto the glass. So I mentioned it was offline. So you take these big stock sheets of glass, you ship them over to the Lowy coating line, you put them back on through robotics, and then it goes through a very intensive washing and drying process. We mentioned we're raining metal onto that glass face or sputtering metal onto that glass face. So we don't want to have any silica sand, oil droplets, water droplets, anything that might keep that coating from adhering to that glass face that could lead to defects by way of pinholes or the coating not adhering to the glass substrate. It's then a completely self-contained system at this point. You have a clean room where we can get in there and inspect it, but outside of that, it's, it's completely contained. The coating then goes through vacuum chambers. And what that does is suck all the air out of the system, creating a zero atmosphere space. Then you will see that the glass starts going into the coating chambers. And some of your modern, modern, modern low-E coating lines could have as many as 32, 34 coating chambers in a row. Each one of those coating chambers would have a different metal target suspended above it. There's a numerous different low E coating options I mentioned when you come to the sputter coating world. So each low E coating has its own specific recipe of what metals do we stack and what thicknesses and what array to give it those optical and thermal performance requirements I've mentioned. Now with that, uh, we can find that some coatings might have five to seven layers of metal. Some may have 12 to 15 layers of metal. Some may have 20 plus layers of metal. Now, if we don't want to apply that coating as part of that specific low E coating recipe, the glass just simply slides to that coating chamber uh, unfazed. If we wanted to actually apply that metal stack, we'd lock the glass inside of that coating chamber. Because we create a vacuum environment, we have the ability to pump in an inert gas that has a positive charge to it. Suspended above the glass is that metal target. Behind that metal target is a giant magnet. We turn on the magnet and that creates a negative charge. Positive attracts negative, negative attracts positive. So as that magnet turns on, all the positively charged gas ions want to rush to the magnet in the way is that metal target. So those gas ions are actually pulverizing that metal target and small microscopic flakes of metal, the same size as these gas ions break off and rain down onto that glass substrate. Because of that zero atmosphere space and the way we pressurize these chambers, as well as the specific metals that we choose in the orientation, we get a nice uniform layering of those metals throughout the stack. So that if we have a stock sheet, you might have five, six, 10, 15 pieces of glass that could be cut out of one stock sheet of glass. So we want to make sure that the uniformity from the front to the back, from the side to the center to the edge, all of that is going to be within spectral tolerances. So uh, to ensure that after the glass exits uh, the different coating chambers, it goes through additional vacuum chambers, which allow us to bring that glass back up to positive pressure. And then it's going through a spectrometer so that we're reading that pane of glass and making sure that it meets all of the spectral tolerances that we advertise it will. Um, so again, that's the summary of the, of the video, much more uh, uh, professionally done when you, you check on our YouTube channel, our website, so I encourage you to do that. Uh, but this is what the byproduct will look like afterwards, right? You get a coating on a piece of glass. If you zoom in like this, uh, you won't actually get this view, but this is to illustrate that is a, a, each Lowy coating is a stack of different metals that create that, that uniform layer. Uh, and what we'll find is that these are microscopically thin layers of metal. So they're one five hundredth of a sheet of paper thick. Uh, the best analogy that I've heard to that is you take a piece of computer paper and you go put it on top of a 10-story 
slurry building, and that's how thick these low E coatings are on a quarter inch thick piece of glass. So it's pretty amazing when we start to talk about the impact to U value, the impact of solar heat gain, how we can still manipulate the light to create all these different aesthetic features uh, can be achieved in such a, a narrow stacking. So uh, really, really well done in terms of the scientists that helped us craft this. We start to talk a lot about silver in these coating stacks, and that's because silver is the workhorse within these stacks of metal. The silver is what allows us to still get access to a high visible light transmission, but get low solar heat gain to get improved thermal performance as well. So we'll start to classify the numerous types of low E coatings that we have in the sputter coating world by, is this a single silver stack? Is this a double silver stack? Is this a triple silver? And what that refers to is how many layers within that stack are comprised of silver. So even though our triple silver coatings have more layers of metal, three of which are silver, it's actually the products that give us the highest access to visible light transmission with low solar heat gain coefficients. So these are the most spectrally selective glass options out there, meaning you're maximizing the amount of mood boosting, productivity increasing visible light, daylight, while blocking the infrared spectrum of that heat from entering into that interior space. And we measure that with a variable we'll see in a little later on called light to solar gain ratio. So now that we know how these products work and the different options we can look at, how do we select in the performance? How do we meet those different goals? This slide does a really good job of, of really illustrating if we have an insulating glass unit on the exterior facade, how does, how does light impact with that? So if we imagine a beam of light uh, hits that piece of insulating glass, essentially three things can happen. It's either gonna be reflected towards the exterior it's going to be absorbed by the glass or it's going to be allowed to be transmitted or flushed into that interior space. So we call that the, the rad equation. The re reflection, absorption, and transmission of that glass needs to add up to 100%. Now, when we talk about light, there's different forms of light, as, as many of you are aware. So uh, light is on a spectrum, and we can find that different wavelengths of light produce different qualities of light. So we can have our more narrow wavelengths that uh, would produce the UVA, UVB light. This is why we wear sunscreen when we go to the beach. This is the harsh light that cause fade and degradation of materials. If we look at the range of 380 nanometer to 780 nanometer wavelengths, that's our visible light transmission. So this is the Roy G. Biv, the color schemes that we can see, right? The visible light that helps with our daylighting and, and productivity uh, increasing uh, uh, attributes. We can go into our longer uh, range wavelengths, and this is no longer light that we can see, but this is the light source that we can feel as heat. This is our infrared light as well. Uh, so it's important to note that the reflection, the absorption, transmission of the UV light needs to add up to 100%. The reflection, absorption, and transmission of the visible light spectrum needs to add up to 100%, and the reflection, absorption, and transmission in that near-infrared spectrum needs to add up to 100%. So it's the reason that if we're trying to look for something that's extremely uh, reflective for privacy, right? If we're talking about 30% outdoor reflectivity, so we get great privacy, that I still can't give you 80% visible light transmission to assist with daylighting. Those are the trade-offs you have to start to consider that if I want something that potentially blocks even more more infrared light, you might have to accept some qualities where some of that visible light transmission is reflected greater to the exterior, so it's a little more uh, silver in appearance, or it absorbs more of that light, so it's a little darker from that exterior appearance. And so this is where we start to understand that even though there's a lot of variables that exist out there, you might have to make some project-specific trade-offs to meet uh, very specific requirements of a job. So taking a one inch insulating glass unit, quarter inch glass, half inch cavity, quarter inch glass, that makes a, a typical one inch insulating glass in the commercial space. We look at two different scenarios here. Scenario on the left is just a tinted gray outboard light, half inch air cavity, clear inboard light. So a beam of solar energy hits that glass, only 7% is reflected to the exterior. A lot of the performance came from 51% of that energy being absorbed by that outboard light. 5% uh, absorbed by the remainder, uh, uh, by the inboard light, resulting in 37% transmission in that interior space. Conversely, if we look at the image on the right, we see a low E coating surface number two of a clear glass substrate. Beam of solar energy hits that IGU and immediately 32% is reflected away from that building. Only 32% absorbed by the inboard light, three, uh, by the outboard light, 3% by the inboard light, resulting in 33% transmission. So a lot of numbers to go through to say relatively similar performance. Why is that important? Well, look at the thermal stress temp of each of these outboard lights. In situations where we're going to be absorbing more of that solar energy, you're going to have greater thermal stress considerations to think about. And it's the reason that tinted substrates 
always require heat treated glass. You don't see annealed tinted substrates in that exterior facade because the thermal stress becomes too great. And we have to look at additional fabrication techniques to uh, minimize the potential for thermal stress breakage. And again, we can start to look at the surface orientation of these low E's. Most low E coatings are designed with a number two surface orientation. Uh, so what does that mean? Well, if we look at numbering an IGU, we number each face of glass from the exterior to the interior. So if we have a double pane insulating glass unit, we have two pieces of glass, but four faces of glass. So the outboard light with surface facing the exterior is surface number one. The outboard light with the surface facing that air cavity is surface number two. We number sequentially through. So if it was a triple pane glazing unit, we have three pieces of glass, six faces. If it's a project that's being built in a hurricane environment and I've got uh, a laminated inboard light, we would have six faces of glass. So uh, consider that as we start to talk about surface orientation and where do I put low E coatings and spandrels or acid etch and pattern ceramic frits as well. But I mentioned most low E coatings are on surface number two. Reason being, we talked about in previous slide that they're designed to reflect heat back towards the exterior. Most of these low E coatings do contain silver and silver can corrode or oxidize over time. So we want to capture it inside of that glazing unit we then edge delete and we hermetically seal that IGU so that that low E coating is protected. So this gives us our first layer of defense to reflect heat from the or back towards the exterior while still protecting that low E coating for the duration of the insulating glazing unit lifetime. There are a few select low E coatings that are designed for number three surface placement. Not overly scientific how to get here. You just turn the insulating glass unit backwards and now all of a sudden you have a number three surface orientation. But with that, we are actually using this for uh, passive solar heat gain in our far northern reaches. So what we see is the sun's energy comes uninhibited through that outboard light, heats up that air cavity, and then you have a low E coating on surface number three. So we have a higher solar heat gain coefficient in this scenario, but we still have a pretty good U value or thermal performance so that we retain that warmer air into that interior space. You may also see some situations where a tinted outboard light is used and you keep that low E coating on number three. It's because that tinted outboard light does offer some improvement to solar heat gain coefficients, so it still could allow for some variability for product configurations. Uh, but it's important to note that while most low E coatings are designed for number two, only a few select low E coatings are allowed to be used on surface number three, because again, you're looking at the backside of the low E coating and these metal stacks are not symmetrical. So you might get a very different aesthetic looking at the backside of that low E coating from the front side or the, the glass side. So again, we wanna pay attention to not just what is that aesthetic, but is it a uniform aesthetic from light to light as we look at it? So you're far more restrictive in terms of number of coatings that can be used in a number three surface orientation. So diving in a little bit more about the specific performance for each of these options. U factor is, is the thermal performance or the insulating factor of these glazing units. So how well does that glass facade block heat gain or loss due to differences in thermal stress temperatures? Air wants to flow from where it's hot to where it's not. So uh, we typically see thermal performance in terms of retaining warm air in the interior spaces during cooler months or, or cooler climate zones. So we do express U value as a percentage. The lower the decimal number, uh, the better that glass does in terms of retaining that warm air in, in colder climate months. Uh, typically what we find with most low E coatings in a one inch insulating glass unit with an air filled cavity, is gonna be in a range of a 0.28 to about a 0.32 U value. We can improve that by adding a denser cavity inside of that IGU or denser air inside of that cavity in that, of that IGU. So we can add a 90% argon fill. And what that does is drop us from about a 0.29 center of glass U value to a 0.24. Uh, this is with our double and triple silver coatings. And as we added more silver, we improved the solar heat gain and the access to light but we don't see a lot of changes in the U value. So if we wanna go much lower than a 0.24, we have to look at other alternative options within that IGU to improve performance. So we can go to triple pane glazing units. And if we use uh, triple pane air filled cavity, or, or, uh, um, triple pane units, argon filled cavity with a low E coating on surface number two, we can have a 0.18 U value. If we look at adding two low E coatings inside of that triple pane unit, so a coating on number two and a coating either on four or five, 
then we can get that down to about a 0.12 center of glass U value. Now, some of that uh, uh, triple pane is becoming more widely adopted, but obviously it's a thicker unit going from one inch to one and three quarter inch. So you have to be able to account for that thicker, heavier unit with your glazing systems and the way we install and ship that glass. So we are finding that you can maintain a standard double pane insulating glass unit uh, and, and still keep the same overall thickness as standard by adding an additional room side or interior surface coating on surface number four of that double pane unit. So we use a, a typical Lowy coating on number two, add an additional Lowy coating on number four that is very durable, designed to be exposed to that interior surface, and I can get to a 0 0.20 U value within that standard one inch insulating glass unit as well. So a lot of other factors can influence U factor as well. Uh, one of the things to keep in mind is the way we capture that glass, the glazing system and the installation method can have a huge impact on the U value. Typically we find that the glass unit itself has a better center of glass U value than the installed fenestration. Every uh, system is different. So we can run, work with the glazing system manufacturers or run what's called CMAS reports to calculate the installed fenestration value from the center of glass value as well. We can also look at different spacer systems. So uh, a typical spacer that we see in the commercial environment is aluminum box spacer, but there are options to do warm edge spacers as well. Uh, again, warm edge spacers are not a center of glass impact, they're a total fenestration impact. So that's where we'd wanna do the analysis of account for the glazing unit, the spacer type and the glazing system to do a full uh, modeling of what that installed value is gonna give us. The other uh, performance factor that we spend a lot of time talking about is the SHGC or the solar heat gain coefficient. And so this is going to be a measurement of how well does that glass block heat transfer into that interior space. And it's done by a calculation of two things. One is the direct transfer of infrared light, but it's also as that light absorbs some of that solar energy and radiates that to the interior space. So that is combined into a decimal value that we refer to as the solar heat gain coefficient. It is different than the shading coefficient. It's basically a different numerical way to calculate it, but they do essentially give us the same relation or factor of, of its blocking heat from coming into that interior space and reducing our cooling loads. So the lower the solar heat gain coefficient, the better job that does at blocking that heat from entering into that space. And in climate zones where cooling loads dominate our energy consumption, reduce the dependency to pump in that artificial air and, and make that a more climate controlled space. Solar heat gain coefficient can be significantly impacted by the low E coating as well as that substrate, especially if it's a tinted substrate. So when we start talking about getting really low solar heat gain coefficients, we can combine low E coatings with those tinted substrates to really improve the performance of that IGU. We talked a little bit earlier about the LSG, light to solar gain ratio, and if something's spectrally or selective or not. Department of Energy considers anything to be spectrally selective if that light to solar gain ratio is a 1.25 or higher. That's a pretty hold metric. There are coatings out there now that can get you to about a 2.40 light to solar gain ratio. And as I mentioned earlier, you simply take your visible light transmission, you divide it by your solar heat gain coefficient, and it gives you a comparative factor to tell you how much of that daylight am I allowing to enter into that interior space while simultaneously blocking uh, heat from coming along with that. And again, finally getting to that visible light transmission, this is expressed as a percentage. The higher that number, the more light that enters into that interior space. Uh, so when we start to talk about visible light transmission, higher is not always better. We wanna really understand the application and, and the use of that space, the orientation, the window to wall ratio. So we wanna take in all these factors and understand through maybe some advanced modeling, how's the uh, sun moving overhead? What are those other shading objects? And how's light penetrating into that space? If you've got a large curtain wall with a west facing elevation and that sun comes uninhibited into that interior space and you've got a lot of computer screens, you're not gonna to wanna to look at a product that has 80% light transmission. That's too much and it causes negative impact from glare potential. So we're gonna to want to right size the level of light transmission to make that space more uh, comfort for, for interior occupants so that they don't have to rely on shades being drawn 100% of the time and defeat the purpose of why we're putting glass into our exterior facade to give us access to views, to create that connected interior, exterior, exterior to interior environment, to bring that daylight in, to help with our energy, to help with our mood, or give us that connection to that outdoor space. Now, from a comparative factor, if we were to take a one inch insulating glass unit, two lights of clear glass before we even introduce a low E coating or a tint, we get 
80% light transmission, 15% outdoor reflectivity. So two things to keep in mind. We don't start at 100% light transmission when referring to performance of low E coatings. We start at about 80%. So 70% VLT is still extremely high compared to just clear over clear uncoated glass. At 15%, Glass is still a reflective building material. I mentioned that earlier. You can have high reflectivity. You can have low reflectivity. Typically, we consider anything that's 15% or lower in outdoor reflectivity to be a low reflective glass. Uh, 16 to about 22 is a medium reflectivity. And then about 23, 24, 25 and higher tends to be more of a highly reflective glass type, right? More mirrored appearance to that glass. More privacy from exterior to interior views during daytime conditions better vision to spandrel blends as well. Uh, this is generalized, extremely so, even more so than the, the restrictive or, or prescriptive code uh, requirements are. But, you know, you used to say that, well, you know, you want that lower solar heat gain in the northern climate zones. And there's still a better point of emphasis because there's more heating uh, uh, usage in these spaces. So if we can reduce that uh, thermal transfer, right? Better U value than we can reduce the dependency on heating. But we're still finding there's ancillary benefits of improving the U value in the Southern climate zones as well. Same thing with solar heat gain coefficient. Prescriptively, you can still find that climate zones four and above, uh, even though they're tightening, offer a 0.36 solar heat gain coefficient. But when I've worked with many architects on doing an actual energy model for their building, we've still found that a 0 0.30, a 0.28 solar heat gain coefficient is favorable for those projects. So as I mentioned, these are general trends, but we're still seeing a little bit of a, a merging of, of more advanced analysis, better product selections for the longevity of these projects. You know, we're not building them for five years. We got to worry about what is energy consumption five, 10, 15, 20, 25 years out from now. So we're starting to get into the aesthetic discussion of glass now. And this is the one that I mentioned to y'all is a little more artistic and a little bit more, well, it depends, right? You know, what are you looking at? How are you looking at the samples? How's the glass going to be installed in the facade? What is the window to wall ratio? What are the interior floor depths? What are the interior finishes? What glazing system are you capturing it in? What's the color of that glazing system? Is it brick? Is it ephus? Is it white? Is it red? All of these factors can create a lot of forced color perception that might impact how we see glass. And so it's important to understand uh, are we looking at the samples of glass and replicating what we might be seeing on our project so that we're getting the most real life viewing conditions to help replicate what we may have from our project. So we always want to start with samples, uh, but we don't necessarily want to make selections for large glass projects on 12 inch by 12 inch samples alone. If you've ever been in a, a situation where you're painting your interior room of your house and uh, you do a little, you know, one inch by one inch or two inch by two inch uh, slab of paint on the wall, you look at it and say, that's the color I want. And then you paint that entire room and all of a sudden it's not nearly close to the color you thought it was. That's kind of that force color perception and scale and magnitude and uh, can really impact what color schemes or what aesthetics tend to dominate our eye. But as we start with samples, let's understand that there's actually two different viewing conditions we can get with glass. One is what we call transmitted color and the other is reflected color. Transmitted color is our ability to see through that glass, visualize an interior object and the color we associate with that glass type as we look through the glass face and those low E coatings. Great way to illustrate true transmitted color is do white spandrel. You put a white opaque object immediately behind the glass, actually on surface number four, and we're seeing the true transmitted color. So if you take a glass sample and you put it on your white tabletop inside of your office, you're gonna be looking at the true transmitted color. And you're only gonna replicate that is if you have white spandrel, you plan to draw the shades 100% uh, of the time using a white shade, you have a skywalk condition where maybe it's a cloudy day behind it and you're able to see through that north and east elevation there in close proximity, or you have a, a corridor with a bright white wall behind it, right? So we're, we typically aren't seeing 100% transmitted color uh, and, unless there's very extreme conditions. In fact, we're actually seeing more weight when we're looking at our facades, especially from a distance, when we look at the reflected color. Uh, and this is going to be as we look at the facade and the light that's bouncing off of that glass and, and coming back to us. So especially during bright blue sunny days where uh, we might have deep interior spaces, we're going to see more of that reflected color. So outside of some extremes, we tend to place a little more emphasis on that reflected color. And one of the great ways to visualize that 
is to take your sample outside and put a black background behind it. And what that does is replicate those deeper spaces, the shadows on the interior, and allow that light to bounce out and force that to us. Again, we don't typically see 100% reflected color. There's just more of a weight that we want to give to that. And so we want to understand as we're looking to design these buildings, will I see more of that reflected versus transmitted color? We start with a couple of projects in this presentation to help really illustrate what that may be. Uh, so as we're trying to look at that in action, we're going to take these two projects and I'm going to tell you that both of these projects have used the same glass type. It's a high light transmission, about 62% coating with only 11% low reflectivity out. And when we look at the building on the left, we see that it is a uh, core and shell. The interior finishes are not completed and you have the ability to look through this corner condition of the glass unit. We also have a lot of white interior ceilings and spandrel conditions. And so what we're finding is that more of the transmitted color is being forced here. So what we start to see is a much greener appearance to the glass because in transmission, this glass type will be greener. But if we look at the far right, the green color tone is reduced substantially to a more neutral appearance. Reason being, we have a large curtain wall with very deep interior spaces, not a lot of light on the sides or the roof of that structure, so a lot of shadows in the interior. So we're seeing more of the color of light that is reflecting off of that, which is much more neutral in general appearance. So this really is a, a pretty big extreme, but can highlight just how variable glass can look at based off the application alone. And as we start to look at the other facade, the orientation of the building, the other dynamics that come into that built environment. Uh, so one of the things to look at here is we have a large box overhanging this glass facade. And due to the nature of the elevation of the sun, time of day, you're actually getting pretty significant shading of this glass facade. So where we have a lot more of that shading and the light's not penetrating deep in those interior spaces, we get a darker appearance to the glass. This is still 68% light transmission with only 11% outdoor reflectivity. But it, because it's darker on the interior, because we see more of that shadow, we're perceiving that reflectivity a little greater versus on the right-hand side where we've got light penetrating into that interior space. It's hitting that back wall. We have the ability to really understand the depth of that space, see the objects inside. Uh, the level of reflectivity hasn't changed, but our line of sight doesn't get drawn to that level of re reflectivity quite as much in that specific area. If we look above, we've got vision units in these four panes here. And so we can start to see those steel structures, high VLT, low reflectivity, extremely transparent piece of glass, light coming from multiple angles to brighten that space. Here, where it looks a little more translucent, it's actually an additional coating added on surface number three uh, that is an acid etching. And so that diffuses the light transmission. It doesn't change the actual level of light transmission. So it's still just as bright behind this glass, but because you have thousands of little scratches on that glass, you're refracting that glass and you're creating more of that diffused, softer look, almost kind of a lantern look. And you can see that in close proximity, you still start to see some of those objects, but they become a little cloudier. You get a little bit better privacy. You know, it depends on lighting condition, but typically if an object's about 16 to 24 inches away from that, this really starts to become a privacy condition glass as well. So uh, a couple different ways we can still impede views, but not block light from entering that interior space. So as we're kind of uh, approaching the end here and considering the various choices that we look at, you know, combination of the glass really matters, right? So it's not just the vision unit that we're looking at. We're building glass facades that incorporate spandrel, that incorporate different built environments, whether it's a conference room uh, or, or an office building setting, whether it's an atrium for transitory or it's a waiting room, we're gonna see people a lot, uh, sitting there waiting for a longer period of time. Schools, higher education, hospitality, residential, a lot of different applications of how glass can be uh, incorporated, but uses of those built environments can dictate what type of glass we want. So if we take this office building here, uh, the spandrel conditions are actually the uh, same spandrel coating on surface number four. But in this instance where we have this cantilever facade, these are more of a classroom setting or an uh, um, uh, conference room setting area. So they wanted to create a little bit more life into these spaces since they're not used 100% of the time. So higher light transmission coming in. It's also the main face of the building. So brighter, more open area. In this instance where we have a higher VLT, lower reflectivity, 
it's much more difficult to hide your spandrel condition. So if you choose a glass type that has something like this, 68% light and 11% reflectivity, and tell me, I want to choose a spandrel that matches the vision, I'll tell you that's not possible. You're going from transparent to opaque, so you're going to see the spandrel condition that exists. So let's choose a color scheme that harmonizes with the project that might not create as much visual contrast, something that maybe just doesn't draw our line of sight quite as much. But if the expectation is you won't see the difference between spandrel and vision, that's not a fair expectation to have. Alternatively, when we go into the office space environment where there's more of the cubicles, people working more throughout the time, uh, you know, we want to be really cognizant about not flooding it with too much light, making it more balanced towards that interior. So we choose a glass here that's more reflective, about 22% outdoor reflectivity, about 40% light transmission. And in this instance, again, same spandrel color, and we can still see the spandrel lines in very specific lighting conditions, but it gets a lot softer blend. So by increasing that reflectivity, we get a much more uniform vision and spandrel harmonization. Coatings that are more reflective are harder to see through. So if we put a reflective coating on number two, it makes it harder to see what we're applying to surface number four as well. Color neutrality is a big buzzword. We just, we just want something that's color neutral. Well, what does that mean? Do you want something that's color neutral and highly transparent? In that case, we go with a, a high transparent low E coating and a uh, low iron glass that we see with this illustration on the left. So it's a you know, very minimalistic view to the glass. Alternatively, we can go with gray tinted glass as well. So it doesn't have the greens and the blues that we might associate as being much more saturated in color, but we tend to see the grays are a little more uh, uniform in appearance. They don't tend to be as decade specific and they tend to be a little more timeless as well. So when we say color neutral, what does that mean? Do we just not want uh, something that appears to have glass in the hole at all? Or do we just some, want something that's not green, not bronze, not blue on that side? We also see that reflective coatings can really mimic uh, the exterior lighting conditions. So these can be a lot more dynamic. So if we have a bright blue sunny day versus a cloudy overcast day, you're gonna see bigger extremes on what that exterior facade looks like. We can take our low E coatings uh, that are more reflective in nature. And as I mentioned earlier, those ones that are 25% and higher reflectivity out are considered more reflective. So both of these projects actually have used the same low E coating on surface number two. Image on the right is on clear glass. So we get 28% light transmission, excuse me, 28% outdoor reflectivity with 43% light transmission and a 0.23 solar heat gain. Taking that same reflective coating and putting it on a light gray tinted glass, you notice the attributes of the glass a little silvered with a little bit of blue undertone. So with this and the light gray glass, we get a nice kind of steely silver blue look to that exterior facade. That combination of the reflective behind the tent drops the reflectivity from 28% to about 19%. I dropped my visible light from about 43% to about 23%. And I improved my solar heat gain from a 0.23 to about a 0.18. So that combination of the reflective coating and that tinted substrate can really have a big impact on the aesthetics, the level of light transmission, and the solar performance of that building. And Bo, I think I see you coming back online. Are we approaching the, the time and coming yep, to an end here? Give about a five minute warning. Perfect. Well, I, I appreciate that. So uh, wrapping up here pretty quickly, again, as I mentioned, the reflective coatings can tend to be a little more dynamic with, is it a bright blue sunny day versus a cloudy day? And what is the overall color rendition we see? But they also can better control the level of light that's coming into that interior spaces. So large curtain walls, maybe 80%, 60%, 50% light is still too much for that space. So don't be afraid to look at product options that maybe are in that 35% to 40% range. It's going to give us greater access to light, deeper penetration in the interior, as well as controlling the level of light and make it more comfortable for the people that are closer towards those uh, exterior wall conditions. Again, thinking about transparency. You know, transparency is not a quantitative value. It's the relation of a uh, relationship between light transmission, level of reflectivity, and lighting conditions. If we have a bright interior, it's going to be a lot easier to create a more transparent facade versus if we had a darker, deeper shadowed interior space. So obviously interior lighting can play effect, but so can putting glazing on multiple elevations and allowing light to penetrate that interior space in a wide variety of lighting conditions. High VLT, low reflectivity certainly helps to increase the level of transparency. But transparency can be different when we're talking about exterior transparency versus that interior transparency. And where does that light source uh, uh, reside? Is it more towards the interior or more towards the exterior? 
The other thing we want to consider is not just the glass selection itself, but those interior finishes, and those built out environments. In this particular setting, we uh, uh, see that this was a tinted substrate that was used on that exterior facade, a very specific spandrel color. And then the clients came in and added just those white level or blinds. So I'm sure that wasn't part of the uh, initial artistic vision of having all these random white blinds drawn behind this blue facade and creating a very different look to that. So there's an opportunity there where even though I don't sell blinds or have a game in the fight, uh, if I know that interior shades are going to be used, let's choose a shade that maybe blends with that spandrel color. And therefore, we still only have two views versus three or four views that might exist. So you just don't see quite the noise or quite the contrast that you might have on that exterior facade. We also want to start to think about being inside of our building, especially if it's a residential structure, hospitality. Uh, there's a lot of urban development infills going on right now, uh, charging high rents and, and usage so that we can feel connected towards those exterior environments and be a part of that city. So think about that level of indoor reflectivity as well. And at nighttime views, when I have greater source of light towards the interior versus the exterior, how well can I still see through that glass and see that city skyline, still be connected to that interior environment? So we can give you all of those factors when we look at uh, individual glazing units and help you make those right selections. So again, uh, kind of finding that balance, doing a little bit of that wrap up, but make sure that as we talked about earlier, that we're viewing those samples correctly. Take them outside if we're talking about the exterior facade. Interior lighting condition, uh, a lot of times especially, can have uh, a real impact on making this glass look greener. We want to go to the right spectrum of light, right? That outside light and make sure that we're comparing it with the right source of light so that that, what, that appearance is going to be as more true to what that installed environment is going to be. And we want to collaborate with you. I mentioned I talked a lot. I had a tremendous amount of coffee. I tried to slow down my voice today, but it's a lot of information to cram in. And so we don't want to make uh, the expectation that you're an expert after this, but we want to be a part of this journey with you. We want you to know the nuances. And we want to have more educated discussions and help you with that process. Everybody has limited bandwidth. So how can we be more resourceful? How can we bring these conversations earlier in the project? Because it's a lot easier to work into initial budgeting than it is a change order on the back end, right? So uh, let's, let's talk early. Let's talk often. And as things continue to change, and involve, we want to continue to be a part of that journey for you and celebrate the projects by taking some photographs of them afterwards, and posting them on our, our websites and LinkedIn, and just really being a part of that built environment that makes our cities and our landscapes. So again, appreciate everybody's time and look forward to that continued opportunity to connect. Um, I've got time to stay on both. There's some additional questions that maybe popped up in chat that we need to address. Please let me know. Yeah, totally. Um, we can hang on for a few minutes and get to some of these questions in case uh, folks have a few minutes to stick around. And then we'll also have it for the recording so that folks can watch it afterwards. Um, and we do have records of your questions. So for anyone who submitted a question, if we don't get to it today, uh, we'll have a record of it so we can follow up afterwards. Um, all right, let's start off just at the top. Um, if not mentioned in the presentation, could you remind us what the parameters of glass sizing are? I've heard with low E coatings, there's a limitation. What can we get in America? Really loaded question, right? So we can talk about what glass manufacturers can produce, but we also need to more specifically talk to what can fabricators do. And we need to keep in mind with all the variability that can exist in fabrication. Are we simply talking about making an insulating glass unit with two pieces of monolithic float glass? Are we talking about adding a ceramic frit? Are we talking about adding a laminated component? Every piece of, um, uh, or every junction of fabrication can impact what are the available sizes based off the machinery that a specific fabricator may have in-house. So if we were to talk about glass sizes, you know, I mentioned that the coated environment now has a 130 by 204 inch standard sheet size. There's not a lot of people that are making IG units that size right now. That's very large. And in fact, if we kept it at quarter inch, that probably wouldn't meet deflection criteria as well. So we would have to start to think about the thickness of that glass substrate as well. So with that, I mentioned earlier, there's about 130 different fabricators that are kind of working with post-temperable sputter coats in the US. All of them have different equipment. They're not all, all uh, synonymous with every single process. And one person may be able to do an IG unit that could get them to you know, 200 units tall. But if it adds Lamy, their Lamy line is only going to be 178 inches tall. So we always want to understand the supply chain group involved. But there are fabricators out there that have domestic capabilities to handle that 130 by 240 super jumbo sheet size and can do every fabrication 
you know, counting for the edge trim to where it would be about 128 inches wide maximum width by 136 inches tall. And they can do that with six, eight, 10, and 12 millimeter thick glass as well. Now that's going to reduce the number of available fabricators and there's gonna be additional cost parameters to think about with that. Uh, a good industry standard is many uh, thresholds can be established, but typically anything that's 50 square feet or higher tends to be classified as an oversized glazing unit and may be subject to additional cost premium. So if you have a, a client that is extremely sensitive to price and wants to have the most open supply chain possible that they can, keep it under 50 square feet and you're gonna find a, a great economies of scale. It doesn't mean you're limited to that, but you might just see there's some cost premiums or, or reduced availability of, of fabricators that can handle that. But many fabricators have over the last several years really up their game domestically, added additional fabrication capabilities and sizes. So we've seen some, some pretty good growth over the last several years. So doesn't answer the question directly, but again, that's that variable component we talk about. Awesome. All right. Um, let's go ahead and do a few more, but first just wanted to say a quick thank you to everyone who joined today. And if you have to jump off, um, totally understand, but anyone who can hang on, it looks like we still got quite a few folks who are hanging on. So we'll go through a few more questions, um, but yeah, just want to give everyone in the audience a thank you for joining today. All right. Um, is heat soaking recommended to avoid spontaneous breaking of tempered glass? Great question. And yes, uh, heat soaking is an extra fabrication process that if fully tempered is used, uh, can be an insurance policy to reduce the incidence of spontaneous breakage. Now, spontaneous breakage can be attributed to numerous different uh, attributes, right? Glass will break. It's the only thing I can guarantee is some condition will cause that glass to break. Now, one of these just happens to be spontaneous or, or something that's hard to explain why it does. Uh, and as I mentioned, that could be due to edge quality or it could be due to something we call nickel sulfide inclusion, which is an invisible air bubble that exists in glass. And any glass manufacturer could have uh, nickel sulfide inclusions. It doesn't mean that that glass is always going to break. And I will say that, uh, you know, if, if I, I assume we're done with the AIA portion now, so I'll speak freely to us. Guardian does everything we can to limit anything that might cause nickel sulfide inclusions, but we can't fully eliminate that. If you do fully temper that piece of glass, you're cutting it to size, you're heating it up to about 1100 degrees and then you're cooling it rapidly. So you're putting greater levels of tension and compression in that piece of glass to make it stronger, to reduce thermal stress. But if we had a, uh, a nickel sulfide inclusion in there, gas wants to expand when it's heated up, when it's heated. So as that glass starts to expand and that glass is pushing on it, you can see that that can actually cause an explosion of that glass. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, it could also be bad edge quality. Maybe there's a slight nick in that, uh, that as that thermal stress comes, you're, you're creating a weak point in it. So heat soaking is a process that you do with fully tempered that if there was a defect in that glass, you're hoping to replicate that thermal cycle and the stress induced uh, during those thermal cycles to cause that imperfection to break in the fabrication process versus the installed environment. So it absolutely reduces the incidence of spontaneous breakage, but it does not fully eliminate it. So keep that in mind that it doesn't mean that you won't have any spontaneous breakage on the job. It just significantly reduces it and it's with fully tempered glass only, not heat strengthened. So a general recommendation is if fully tempered is not required for safety, structural or specific code regulations, heat strength and glass can be another policy that'll still give you a stronger glass type, reduce your thermal stress resistance, but doesn't require that heat soaking or have that same uh, potential for spontaneous breakage. Awesome. All right, great. And let's go ahead and do one more before we jump off for today. Um, all right. What is the difficulty in getting an exact replacement when damages have occurred? These are really good questions uh, today. And again, um, Depends, right? So my assumption here is uh, it could be twofold. One, we could be talking about a very old project. And as we've seen building energy codes change substantially over the last few decades, so have the products that we've had to create to be able to match that. And IGUs can last for a very long time. You know, typically industry standard is 25 years is a good average life cycle of an IGU, but it doesn't mean that an IGU can't last 40 years. And, and there are plenty out there that are 40 years old. And so if you're talking about having to replace a, a glass unit that's 20 years old you're, or, or 30 years old, you're talking about technologies that probably just aren't as available today. So in this instance, as we've revamped coding profiles and product options, you just don't seem to see the same level of, 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 you don't see the same portfolio of products when that energy code didn't dictate there. So we tried to find a product that is 
close in general aesthetic that, that we can get there, uh, but it might might be visibly different. The other could be maybe it's a more recent project, but it could have just been something that's so custom and so specific that, uh, you, you know, maybe that tent is only run once a year, or maybe fabricators only bring it in for very specific project orders. So you don't just have a piece of glass sitting on the floor, but now you're talking about having to produce in large quantities or a fabricator having to pull in pack quantities just for a single piece of glass. And so uh, it's not that you can't get it, but the cost to, to bring in X amount of glass for one piece can be quite high on that side. Uh, so that's a generalized answer on, on that side. And again, uh, something we can explore if you have a project specific uh, uh, desire. One thing I've seen done, if you have typical sizes and that, that replacement needs to be done in a high profile area, perhaps you can pull a piece of glass from the back side of the building, put that in the high pro profile area, and then the piece of glass that doesn't match perfectly, maybe you put it in a less conspicuous space. Awesome. All right. Um, it looks like there are a few more left here, but we're about 10 minutes past and I noticed some folks starting to drop out. So um, if it sounds good to you, Alan, we'll kind of save the rest for post-event follow-up. Works for me. All right, great. So thank you again to everyone who attended. Thank you so much, Alan, for a great presentation, for Kremen and all that information in uh, this short time we had. Um, I know it was really informative for me and I'm sure the audience really learned a lot today. So really appreciate you uh, participating in today's webinar and I hope everyone has a great holiday season. Thank you, Bone. Thanks to all, everybody that attended. All right. Thanks, everyone. Bye.